This is the Friday, January 29, 2021 version of the Market Plus segment. Joining us now, Sue Martin. Hi, Sue. I realized when we started the main show, I just said wheat and went marching. I didn't even really say hello. I'm sorry. You're hello. just fine. We need to get going. We had a lot to talk about. Yes, we did, and yeah. it went in a New York sec. It does. Um, and most of the time when people talk to me, it just feels like it goes on forever, but that's a whole different story for another time. I uh, had to skip over uh, feeder cattle, and we were talking between shows here. It's still the cost of feed that's hanging around their neck. But how is it, though, that the feeder cattle aren't going away and just dropping off of a cliff? How is it they're able to hang around but still not make a lot of money right now? I think it's because there is still a good demand for the feeders. And corn, um, while it's moving up and it's going to, I believe, continue to get higher, um, I think that the producer or the feeder has um, an optimism. And, you know, feeding cattle kind of gets in your blood, so they tend to always want to be doing that. Um, but I look at the, the feeder market, and that market led us down seasonally through the month of January. And that's pretty typical. Now it's trying to catch and it's bouncing back. And, and I think that, um, you know, the pen conditions aren't the best right now with the snows and melting and moisture and stuff like that. So I think that's affecting the market and maybe underpinning it, although on Friday the market cratered. Um, I think that when we look at feeder cattle, the 130 mark to 133 uh, is pretty good support. Um, but on the same token, you get up over and you look at these deferreds and they're pretty high priced. Um, I'm very bullish the fourth quarter of this year. Or the, yeah, the fourth For quarter. For live cattle or everything? Well, if I'm right on live cattle, feeders will kind of come along too. Okay. But I'm very, very friendly to the fourth quarter for prices. And I think that um, uh, these breaks in here are going to offer producers maybe some opportunity to protect themselves. Okay, so Aaron in Ochidna, Iowa is asking us via Twitter. He says, on Thursday, February live cattle dropped almost $7 below April, an all-time record. What's going to happen to that spread by first notice? Can cash pull itself from the muck? We haven't really even broken into the hole how these spreads are so far. Well, I think that the February... Um, I think the cash market's going to try to firm here and come back stronger. By the time we get to the April time frame, I think the futures, contrary to probably what some people think, unless we break 126, then we may have a different story going. But I think the futures are going to try to come down to 120 and maybe go far enough that they'll align down towards 117 with the cash market. Uh, I think in April you'll see a cash market of around 117. And the extreme would be 120, if we could do that. Um, this year's cattle market, I don't think is, you gotta give the cattle market credit though, uh, because with record production or um, animals coming to market and demand is just consuming it, we're seeing right. good demand. Um, you know, granted, I think it's the, um, restaurant business that's starting to go to the food service and they're all starting to book. Schools are back <coughs> open for yes. a, a big case and that's eating yes. through it. I need to move on to how you were right about something. We have Bradley in Nebraska was watching this summer when you said Sue was spot on with her dry summer predictions last year. So what's your crystal ball say for 21? Also, are China's corn stocks really as big as they claim? If inflated, what is the impact? on the world balance sheet as they claim to have the most corn stocks? Well, we'll take the last and come back around to the first. First off, I am, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, I think China's numbers are inflated. You look, first off, they, they were uh, draining their reserves because of poor quality corn mm -hmm. and getting rid of it. Then they came into this last year and they hit horrendous weather uh, I think, what, the worst flood uh, in 200 years, uh, fall armyworm. They just did not have a good year of production. And that's at a time when they have, because of Af African swine fever, they needed protein right away. So they started increasing their poultry uh, production. And so that takes more soy meal and more corn. And then now also working back to get the hog industry back up to speed where it was 
and I wouldn't be surprised they surpassed that because they're now moving mom and pops, which a large portion of production in China used to be mom mm -hmm. and pops. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be the case anymore. It's going to integration and more efficiency and you name it. And some of those can, you know, entities are just mind blowing as to how big they really are. But China's also been feeding uh, illegal drugs or illicit drugs. Um, they're seeing mutations in the virus. So they are totally free of this African swine fever. Or upfront on what's That's happening. That's right, exactly. So I think when I look at, at uh, China's corn usage, I see them needing corn. Now there's estimates out there of around 28, 26, 28, 30 million metric tons of needs for imports. Uh, the ag attache, like I mentioned in the show, is 22. Um, but I think China needs corn and they need good quality corn. And here's the kicker. You've got Brazil with the safrina crop. That's getting, I think, 1.5 or 1.4 percent planted. That's way behind normal. And that's in the center south. Um, I think that when you look at the safrina crop, first off, a lot of times that is the crop that gets exported. Mm -hmm. But in this entity, they are a situation, they, you know, Brazil's looking at more beef production, pork production. They're going to need more feed corn. And also, they always relied on uh, sugar cane to fulfill the ethanol industry. But sugar prices are high. And so, consequently, that sugar cane's probably going to find its way into the export market, which means they're going to have to draw on the second crop of corn. Are we going to be dry here? Do you see weather as an issue in the United States? In I don't see it quite as bad as last year. What I see and what I'm catching from the services I take, and I take one out of Brazil and then I have several in the U.S., um, that what I see happening is we're evolving into a very dry situation. Uh, last year we were dry. This year we'll kind of ebb and flow. And I, by the way, am very negative for the last half of this year on grain prices. Okay. So, but as we get into 2022, I think there's where the drought kicks in. And we really have a tough year next year that leads us to God only knows how high prices will go in 2023. I'm very bullish 2023. I've mentioned before the great grain robbery. And yes, you know, with internet, everybody knows with information. But if you look at what's been happening, China, before they really totally agreed to the phase one agreement, and even right as they did it, they were making deals around the world for many commodities. And, but you look at South America, Brazil, Argentina, US were the major producers, exporters of corn and soybeans. And yeah, it could even be, uh, we're a pretty good aggressive exporter of wheat, although Russia is the world's largest. So because of that, I see China trying to outstep everybody. And then COVID came into play. And all of a sudden, everybody started to realize that this just-in-time inventory that went into effect in the 90s was no longer a good thing. And you've seen protests around the world. It just hasn't been in the U.S. It's been many places around the world. India had India a huge... India had farmers you go through the capital this week. Exactly. Yeah. So I think countries are starting to realize they need to keep food on hand. And we're going back to that old-fashioned re build reserves. And all of a sudden, who's been here first? China. Okay. The Internet leads me to the topic of the week for investors. And there's three different versions uh, I think I'm going to just, I'm going to go with Jim in Worth County, and he's talking about when short selling is allowed, there is endless supply with set demand. Would eliminating short selling take much volatility out of the market? No. And would it be a good idea to take out? No. Why? And the reason I say it, I've heard forever people say, well, if we didn't have those speculative funds, you know, I hate to tell you, you need those speculative funds for liquidity and to get you prices as a producer that you need to have. Okay, take GameStop. GameStop. If you looked at a chart on GameStop, that market was already set up with a bullish tendency already. And the market has a heavy short position that overstayed itself. It should have been out of the market. There was a gap up, a breakaway gap. 
before any of this happened. Then it started to move and break out of trend lines. It had already was giving tips that they were in a bad position and should have been getting out. So I think this would have happened regardless. Could it happen in commodities, though? Oh, it does. To you, that extent? Maybe not quite that extent, but um, it does happen in commodities because, and here's the thing, in GameStop, do we have a commitment of traders report on it? You know, we have that on commodities. commodities. And we know hedge funds, uh, managed money, uh, you know, commercials, that type of thing. We know what they're doing. Um, I think it's we need them to add liquidity, but um, bottom line is the fundamentals will come back to play. My, the way I approach markets and always have, I'm very technically oriented. I love timing, but I use those to get the, try to catch turns or, you know, of trends in the market, and then I try to use the fundamentals to drive it. And I think that's... For me, that's worked fairly well. It's worked for a long time. I'm going to ask you a couple yes or no questions. Tim and I want to know, can we get 450 or better cash prices for this fall, or will it disappear? No, I think you'll get 450. I, sh I said that wrong. I should say, yes, you will. I, yep. think, I think futures could go to $5 okay. on a new crop. So Wes in Iowa then asks, will fall corn and soybean prices top what we have now? No. Okay. All right. And I have one last thing. Um, if I have 40 acres, can't decide if I'm going corn or soybeans. I haven't done anything to the soil. It's ready to go. Would you be planting corn or soybeans this spring? Corn. That will do it for this product that we call Market Plus. And next week, we're going to look at an innovative data gathering project that helps pinpoint increased insect pressure and plant disease outbreaks. And Mark Gold will be here to break down the commodity markets. I'm Paul Yeager. Thank you so very much for watching, listening, or reading.